So I'd like to introduce our final keynote speaker for the morning. It's David McAllister. He is a German politician who's been a member of the European Parliament since uh, 2014, um, Vice President of the European People's Party and Chair of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and he has been keeping a very close eye on the relationship between the UK and the EU. So David, uh, welcome to our conference. We look forward to hearing uh, your perspective on where we are now. Thank you. Okay, thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you for inviting me and warm greetings from my hometown in Northern Germany, near Cuxhaven at the North Sea coast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again, just um, a little month after the last time I met at least some of you on the 12th of month, February for the webinar entitled Where Next for Brexit? Back then, we were, I guess, all assuming that by now only technical and linguistic obstacles would lie ahead of the final ratification of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. But we're not quite there yet. And therefore, let me first of all briefly bring you up to date on where we stand with the ratification of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement in the European Parliament. This agreement is, of course, unprecedented in many respects. It's the first time that the European Union negotiated an agreement with a former member state. For the first time, instead of negotiating points of junction, the EU has negotiated an agreement on orderly divergence. This was done at record speed, considering the scale and the complexity of such negotiations. As we are witnessing these days, the implementation will also be a complex exercise. Let's keep in mind that no free trade agreement can ever match EU membership nor the participation in the single market. Regrettably, the agreement is not completely exhaustive, for instance, lacking notably provisions on foreign policy and security cooperation. So the text is incomplete. Many items are unfinished business. It is clear that more work will be need to be done to broaden and to deepen our partnership in the upcoming years. I would like to recall just as one example that the UK can come back to the Erasmus Plus program at any time should the government wish to revise its decision. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement provides the possibility to rejoin Erasmus Plus as a third country on the basis of the provisions regarding EU programmes. Generally, I believe it is in the interest of both sides to maintain a close and lasting cooperation in many fields, given our shared values and interests, especially in an increasingly unstable world. Therefore, I would like to think of the TCA as a, quote, living agreement, unquote, and in the future, it can serve as a framework for deepening cooperation on at least some of the currently missing policy areas. The design of a single institutional framework allows for the integration of additional chapters of cooperation. Moreover, as for example, the chapter on fisheries with a time frame of five and a half years shows, this TCA will certainly need to be updated in the course of time. The complicated governance structure is likely to prove challenging, and there may be a case for simplifying and for rationalizing it in due course. The United Kingdom remains a crucial partner, an important neighbor and relevant actor in the global scene. In case goodwill is demonstrated in London, the European Parliament stands ready to work towards the deepening and broadening of our partnership. As you know, we are in a process of internal reflection in the European Union through the framework of the new conference on the future of Europe. Our own internal reflection, our own internal evolution might also have some impact on the future development of EU-UK relations. I hope we will deepen and not drift further apart in the future. 
As there was no time for both sides to fully ratify the agreement before the 1st of January, and in order to avoid the notorious cliff edge, the EU and the UK agreed that the TCA would be applied provisionally until the end of February. In the meantime, both sides agreed on a technical extension of this period until the 30th of April to allow for the legal and linguistic revisions in all 24 languages to be completed. This is important as it is required by constitutional provisions in some of our EU member states. The European Parliament's work on the constant recommendation is currently ongoing in the two League Committees, the Trade Committee and the Committee on Foreign Affairs. And in parallel, the UK Coordination Group, which I have the honour to chair, is working on an accompanying resolution that will set our views as European Parliament both on the agreement, but also on the implementation. However, when it comes to the constant procedure in the European Parliament, the date for the plenary vote has still not been decided. We still lack the necessary clarity about the UK government's intentions with regard to the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. As you all have followed, Two weeks ago, the UK government announced unilateral measures extending the grace periods under the Northern Ireland Protocol. Shortly afterwards, Commission Vice President Marishevchevich expressed our strong concerns over this unilateral action, saying, quote, as this amounts to a violation of the relevant substantive provisions of the Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland and the good faith obligations under the withdrawal agreement, this is indeed the second time that the UK government is set to breach international law, unquote. The protocol is an integral part of the withdrawal agreement. It is enforced since the 1st of February 2020 and has full effects under international law. Its provisions are fully binding on both sides of the channel, both for the EU and for the UK. I want to be very clear here. The European Union has offered to discuss the flexibilities allowed by the protocol framework. We are willing to offer pragmatic solutions to allow authorities, citizens and businesses to prepare for the application of the protocol. However, and this is unfortunate, the UK government has again chosen the slippery slope of acting outside the framework of the protocol. What is even more unfortunate is that this occurs at a moment where the European Parliament is still examining the trade and cooperation agreement and, as mentioned, has yet to decide when the vote on the consent will actually take place. So these developments are unhelpful and untimely, to say the least. Escalating the situation is not the way forward. The European Union has demonstrated time and time again a clear and an ambiguous will to a pragmatic, solution-driven approach to facilitate everyday life in Northern Ireland. The British unilateral decision, unfortunately, undermines this approach. So in response to these developments, on the 15th of March, the Commission had to send the UK government a letter of formal notice for breaches of substantive provisions of EU law concerning the movement of goods and pet travel made applicable by virtue of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Let me now move on to the future parliamentary cooperation. We are indeed starting a new era in the relations between the European Union and the United Kingdom. And parliamentarians have a special duty to keep open the communication channels between our respective constituencies. Democratic debate and accountability are key. As the European Parliament has demanded in a number of resolutions, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement includes the possibility to establish a joint parliamentary body, the so-called Partnership Assembly which could make recommendations to the Partnership Council. This assembly would serve as the body for both the EU and UK parliaments to exchange views 
on our partnership. The President of the European Parliament, David Sassoli, and the House of Commons Speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, have exchanged letters a few weeks ago with a view to actually start the process. In my view, decades of cooperation, especially after relations with the national parliaments intensified with the Lisbon Treaty, can provide a solid foundation for our future dialogue. We should set up this assembly as soon as possible. Let me conclude by focusing on the new institutional solution for the involvement of civil society in the future debates between the UK and the EU on common policy cooperation priorities. The TCA contains provisions on dialogue and consultation with civil society organizations, including through the establishment of domestic advisory groups to be consulted regularly on issues covered by the TCA and any supplementing agreement. The European Parliament across party lines welcomes these provisions and urges the strong involvement of the EU and UK trade unions and other social partners as well as civil society organizations on both sides of the channel in the monitoring and in the implementation of this agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of the agreement will depend on its implementation and the goodwill on both sides to make the most of it. Merci bien, vielen Dank, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and a very strong message at the start there, I think, that we uh, in the UK could rejoin Erasmus Plus at any time as a third country. And I guess if what, if what we've heard over the um, uh, over the past morning of uh, brilliant contributions from David and others um, has been uh, a description of everything that we're facing uh, uh, now that we've left the European Union, but also I think some indications of what our first steps should be uh, in improving on this uh, awful isolationist deal we have in front of us uh, to start to build back some of what we've lost. And I think Erasmus Plus, but also musicians' visas and some of the other issues that we've talked about this morning should be on the top of our list of things we need to campaign uh, to change uh, in the immediate term to, uh, to make things uh, better for everyone in the UK.